ladies and gentlemen, Graham Hancock and John Anthony West. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so this is going to take the form of a conversation or perhaps an argument, because um, John is an argumentative sort of fellow, uh, and I guess I am too. Um, uh, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Now, I, I want to tell you about the first time that I met John Anthony West. Uh, at that time, I had begun research on my book, Fingerprints of the Gods, and John Anthony West was one of the main reasons I began uh, work on the possibility of a lost civilization, because there is a lot of woolly nonsense talked in this area, but a number of people are doing really serious work, and John has been at the leading edge of that for decades. Uh, I reached out to him, and the first time I met him was in Egypt in 1992. And at that time, John was leading one of his guided tours of Egypt. And let me say now that if any of you, and you should be, are thinking about making a journey to Egypt, make it with John Anthony West, because it is an utter revelation. An utter revelation. This is a man who has immersed himself in the mystery of ancient Egypt for decades, and, and he shares that mystery and that enthusiasm and gives you insights into places that otherwise with, with uh, other people you would just pass by and not realize what they meant. And so I, I met John actually on a cruise ship on the Nile by prearrangement, and then I joined your tour for, for a day. And uh, it was an incredible experience. It really, it really was. And you know, to get this uh, wisdom, shared about Egypt and, and the love and the passion for Egypt is something that nobody else can replicate. So if you're going to Egypt, go with John, okay? <laughs> okay, how much was that? Uh, <laughs> um, actually, they, yeah, hold they supply us each with these dildos and I don't know what the <laughs> hell they're for. Um, the, but a couple of things. One is I, I usually start off a lecture, and this was, this venue here with Graham lecturing and then us having a conversation was the, the, the brainstorm of one of my friends who'd been on an Egypt trip with me, which is really good because otherwise you have two high-powered, non-stop talkers, one after the other, and it gets to be exhausting. Everyone would be falling asleep by the time they got to me. But this way, now we can go back and forth and tell jokes and have fun and stuff Makes like sense. that. And I just want to say that with Egypt, the difference between Egypt and so many of the places that Graham was just talking about is that it's only in Egypt that we have that much of that lost civilization still available to us. And I usually start a lecture off, I won't now, but I'll just tell you what I usually started off with, <laughs> which is that Egypt is like sex, and that gets everybody's attention. But why is it just like sex? Well, you can read all about it, and that's informative. And you can look at pictures, and that's informative in a different way, but you don't actually understand it at all until you experience it, period. And Egypt is like that, and the ancient civilizations are like that. It's possible to go to great sacred architecture around the globe. In India, the great mosques of, of Islam, and uh, what else, uh, Tiwanaku, all of these other places Graham has gone to. Gobekli Tepe, you don't really get that sense of a sacred because, yet, because it's only less than 5% excavated and now it's all loused up, but they've covered it over and it's near enough to the Syrian border where they can throw grenades at you. So um, I'm all for taking chances for archeology, span but not, not those kinds of chances. Anyhow, uh, Egypt, Egypt is, the two weeks there is a, is an immersion course, it's like a PhD course in what civilization once was. And it, it's only, I won't say only by doing that because I got led into it before I got into Egypt, but it is, you understand what civilization once was and the dramatic difference between what was civilization and what's now laughably called progress. And it's only in Egypt that you can get that, nowhere else. I mean, everywhere else has, a temple here and a monument there and so forth and so on, but nothing on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour basis. 
that gives you that. So if you think this is a plug for taking my trip, it is. But <laughs> that said, unfortunately, I'm, I'm pretty much the only, um, pretty much the only wheel in town in this regard that, as Graham said, there are a lot of unicorns out there that are busy feeling the energy and sniffing the crystals. And I, I don't have anything against that as such, except you come back not understanding Egypt. And the, the, the difference is that um, there are only a handful of people that understand symbolist Egypt, that's Shola de Lubitsch's Egypt, well enough to transmit it, and I happen to be the only one that leads tours. So there's no competition, it's easy. All you need, <laughs> anyway, all you have to know is that not to listen to the prestitutes of, the, of CNN or NBC or Fox or anything John like that. John has these wonderful phrases that he coins. The prostitutes, <laughs> the quackademics. And the quackademics, yeah. Well, I have, see, I, I, I started out not as, not as a scholar. I'm a scholar by default, actually. I started out as a novelist, playwright, mostly satire. And I, I still do that. It's my favorite hat to wear. But most of the time, for a variety of reasons, I find myself wearing my Egyptological pith helmet. Now, that's enough about me. Well, um, actually, the first thing I want to ask, I think, it's, I think it's really important that the legacy of John Anthony West is preserved for the future, that history does not uh, gloss you over and forget about your name. So my first question is, actually, what are you doing for yourself? You're doing a lot for all the rest of us, but what are you doing for yourself and to make sure that your legacy is, is preserved? Well, I, don't, I don't actually give a damn about that. Um, See, my legacy. that's the character. Yeah, only, yeah. only other people give a damn. John just well, doesn't that's care. Their, that's their job. Um, <laughs> the, who is it you had up there that was regretting that it took him so long to get to get recognized that there was no one left to gloat over. Oh yeah, J. Holland Yeah, Bratz, well, yeah. I figure I'm still around for a while. Yeah. And, and even if I outlive them, not by that much, and apropos to what you were talking about, and the last few, few times I've heard you, Graham, is that we're close, it's, it's getting close now. Yeah. Um, I don't think they feel the heat yet. They don't understand the situation. I yeah. sometimes tell them, that when they get certain kinds of opposition, it makes me feel the way I imagine a cannibal chieftain must feel watching a boatload of missionaries approach. <laughs> it's, uh, I salivate. Yes. And another, another image I came up with, it's, it's like a, they're living, they are living like a little town in Russia around 1220. And every once in a while, this crazy horseman comes wheeling in a cloud of dust. Uh, you know, out from the out from the east, telling them they better pray, pay tribute because in a couple of years this wild man is going to come and ravish the tear down the walls and ravish the women and murder all the men and they want he wants tribute right then and there and they just send him on his way and three years later the great Khan is at the gates and. That's exactly what he does. So in a, in, in a very real sense, uh, archaeology, even though they may not know it yet, are under siege. They're facing Genghis Khan. Uh, they, the they, they don't know it, and I'll be around to gloat. <laughs> <laughs> so John, you've, um, the, you've written two, two books that, 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 mm. that I'm very familiar with, which is Serpent in the Sky and yeah. The Traveler's Key to Ancient right. Egypt. And again, another plug. <laughs> the Traveler's Key to Ancient Egypt, forget about all the other guidebooks to Egypt. The Traveler's Key to Ancient Egypt is the book to go around Egypt with, and it was the book that I went around Egypt with on my first journeys, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Any other books in the works? Any, any other thoughts? Well, the other one that I've just published, which is edited by me, it's not written by me, but it, it's apropos your talk, actually, where, what, you, what we, you didn't get into and which is more, more my province than yours, is the philosophy yes. behind this. Because, yes, ancient civilization, it's very nice and all of that, and it's really good to know that what we call progress is what I call shiny barbarism. But it doesn't, that in and of itself does not tell you what a true civilization is. Yeah. And a true civilization, if my own definition is, is um, what occurs when, a, when people, not everybody, it can't be everybody, I don't think that the universe is constructed in such a way that everybody participates in at that level, but when enough people 
understand that they're here for a purpose, and that purpose is spiritual, for lack of a better word, or divine, for lack of another better word. Um, it's only then that a civilization arises and replaces barbarism under whatever name, smartphones, dumb phones, whatever the hell they are. All of those things are quite unnecessary. What's necessary is something that anchors you to a true philosophy. And that's the, the very interesting thing about this new book. I, you know it, it was on, David was on your yeah. the author of the month. And this is a good friend of mine who financed actually our own trip to Gobekli Tepe a few years ago. And, uh, and then was working, he was, he was a Christian pastor, but a very unusual Christian. He actually practiced it, very rare. Um, it's about as rare as an open-minded scientist or still rarer, a visionary billionaire with a conscience. I haven't met any of those yet. Uh, but anyway, David was a pretty rare bird. And he was doing all of this very careful scholarship on the NDE, the near-death experience. There's a lot of material that's been written on them by people who've been through that, through that tremendous experience. And without going into a long palaver, he was collecting a lot of information and I was saying to him, we, didn't, we were good friends, but not that close friends and at a distance. And I was telling him, David, you've got to make a book of this. this is, he, he was going at it in a particular way of systematically going. David Solomon. David Solomon, yes, that's right. Systematically going at it in such a way that it wasn't just his personal experience, he had his own kinds of personal ex spiritual experiences. But it made sense of it in a kind of way, and my sense of it was sort of like with our work, we're on the cusp, it's, it's close now. Yeah. Anyway, David was putting all of this material together and said, well, I'm not a writer, I'm gonna do it. And then all of a sudden he was started, he was a Tai Chi, apart from being a Christian pastor, he was a high level Tai Chi practitioner and a bonsai master. He'd studied bonsai, that wonderful Japanese way of torturing trees into being works of art. But I, I, even David got me understanding more about bonsai. That's how I always saw it from the outside. He said, no, no, the tree has to allow itself to be treated that way. Very interesting philosophy. No, really, not getting this time. Um, anyway, David, then started losing his balance and getting, and he was a physical, you know, a guy. And, and a Tai Chi uh, practitioner, and that's uh, dependent upon balance. And he started losing his balance, and the way the upshot of it was that he was diagnosed with a glioblastoma, glioma it's called. It's what Ted Kennedy died of. Um, with an, a 100% fatal brain cancer. And then he realized that he had a mission, that he was doing all of this work on NDEs, but he needed a writer. He was, a, he was an excellent and meticulous uh, um, uh, scholar, but he wasn't a writer. Being a writer is something else again. So he drafted me in and was, uh, I, I, owe, I owed him a big favor anyway, but I also recognized that this was something that was missing, as it were, from the philosophy uh, the spiritual philosophy as expounded by, I'm, I'm in the Gurdjieff Society. That, uh, that's one way of expressing it. It's not the only way, but all of the, the, all of the great traditions, religious traditions, spiritual traditions, have this as a background, and the experience, as it were, the, the, the NDE, what that actually is when you, when you look at enough of them and understand what they are, it's not a hallucination which the quackademics would have us believe because they want to make sure that everybody thinks the world is as meaningless as they experience it. Um, and it's not. Uh, we don't have to buy into their rubbish. And the NDE is actually a few moments of grace, of something over and above what any spiritual discipline or experience can give to you. In other words, it comes from out of the blue and it happens at the point of death, um, or that can be one time at which it happens. And the power of the ND, in the way that David puts it together, um, is that it, it, it's, it's understood that this is available 
to all of us. We don't know about all of us, actually. I mean, David doesn't get into that. There are some really malevolent people. Do they have it, too? Does Dick Cheney have it? Or Donald Trump? I don't know. I hate to think so, because I would like to think that there is something like divine justice. But um, most of us, if you're in this room, let's say, should have left long ago if you don't, don't agree with it. But most of us in this room are in it because you think you're going to learn something or another that's valuable to you rather than watch CNN at home or Fox News, God help you, even worse. The, so David had all of this material and I helped him put it into, into perspective. But in the doing of it, I realized that this was the sort of thing, not necessarily the thing itself, but it's the sort of thing that could tip the balance, that, that, that's readily accessible. Graham is talking about a lot of science in there, and so are we when we're doing our geology. Um, symbolist Egypt is not for everyone. Gurdjieff is not for everyone. The hard-nosed, hardcore Zen and, and Hinduism and Islam really is special stuff. But this NDE experience is something that, if everybody understood that that was in store for them, even, even if it were at the end. Of course, those who don't come back to tell the tale don't come back and you don't know what their experiences are. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of spaces left there, but it's the sort of thing that everyone, I would say everyone can resonate to. Everyone can know? resonate to, and uh, I have had a near-death experience mm. myself, so I totally resonate to oh, it. You have, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was almost killed with an electric shock, and I left my body and came oh, really? and saw myself from up really? above. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I didn't know that. I didn't get the tunnel of light and the relatives saying, mm. you know, it's not mm. your time, but right. I, I left my body yeah. and it, um, about the age of 17, and it made a profound impression upon me, which, which has lasted to this day, um, which um, has the, that kind of experience. You're absolutely right. That kind of experience multiplied out. Enough people speak about this. It brings the whole materialist reductionist paradigm down in ruins, That's right. that, that consciousness cannot be an epiphenomenon of brain activity. Right. There's something else deeper right. going right. on. Right. Yeah. And that's, I mean, a thing that we talk about all the time from various either scientific or, philosoph excuse me, or philosophical standpoints, mm -hmm. but not that experiential one. Yes. And that's why I felt it was worth taking a year and a half out of my life to work on that book with right. him. And he died just as it got published. He was, oh. he was a Christian, he, he prayed that he'd be given enough time to get the book out, and that's just what he got. And the book is called? The, the book is called The Dead Saints Chronicles. The Dead Saints Chronicles, um, yeah, a great Zen, title. A Zen, well, he was good at titles. He yeah. wasn't a writer, but he was good at titles. Right. A Zen Journey Through the Christian Afterlife. Right, right, that's, right. I have copies back there. Great. And if you're wondering why that's back there, with, when I, you know my specialty is Egypt, that's why, because it doesn't seem as though it's connected, but it, it brings home that experience that is our goal. Actually. And wouldn't you say, I mean, I would say it is, is connected because, I mean, the ancient Egyptians were a people who put their best minds to work for mm. 3,000 years on considering the mystery of death. This is um, oh, in that way, surely absolutely. central to ancient Egyptian yeah, culture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Talk about the ancient Egyptian judgment scene a little bit, perhaps. Well, yeah, I mean, that's as, um, this becomes the, uh, the whole of judgment. Um, I mean, in Christianity, it's there too, but in, yeah. a, in, in a simplified version, yeah, the, the, when you die, you, you, go, you, you, you get tried in the great court of Osiris. Your heart, which is the seat of conscience, and now, in fact, it's very interesting when scientists recognize what everybody else knew 4,000, 5,000 years ago, um, the heart, in fact, does, is not just the muscle that pumps blood, it has its own thinking center, which those of you who are familiar with Gurdjieff will know from his work and the work of his, his, his own students. And, and so the, the heart is weighed against the feather of Ma'at. Ma'at represents cosmic equilibrium, justice, etc. And if, if the heart, then it gets complicated, if the heart has to be lighter than that feather for you to pass on to the next um, to the next stage, which is probably reincarnation. There are two, two stages, it gets very complicated in, in the ancient Egyptian death, 
death ritual or death understanding of death. And the one is that you are, you, you come to the book of the, it's always called the book of the, the book of the dead. It's technical. Um, it's actual translation is the book of coming forth by day. It's the book of new life, which I take to be a reincarnation. And then there's a second path as described by the genius with the unpronounceable name, R.A. Shwala Dulubich, um, as, the, as the path of Horus, and Horus becomes the Christ, and the whole thing, Egypt slides into Christianity almost seamlessly, minus the science. The science, the science mostly gets lost along the way, and even there, if you read the right books and you look into it from a particular angle, you see that even the science was never entirely lost. And there's the sense uh, in, that, in that judgment scene. It's not as moralistic as it sounds. Mm. Um, there's, the, there's the sense that uh, we've been given a precious gift to live and to live in a human body. And, and what have we done with it, actually? What did you do with that? With that? Uh, that's the, one of the things I get from the Egyptians. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, actually the, the problem nowadays is or one, one of the many problems is that it's next to impossible to, well, the way I put it always is, it is, it's next to impossible to make a living out of your own creativity. And if you manage to do it by hook or by crook somehow or another, you pay a big price. And if you're not doing that, if, what you, if your daily life is spent at something you hate and you watch the ads say, when should I to retire at 35? And that's what you want, you're on the wrong path. But given what, given what we have, what we have facing us, I have, I don't know if I talked about it the last time we were on there with the, the five cowboys. You know, everyone knows the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? Those who don't know about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, raise their hand. Everyone knows, or some people are shy. Um, anyway, the four horsemen are death, sorry, wait, are, are war, that's it, war, pestilence, famine, and death. And actually, if you stop to think about it, that's kind of peculiar because the only one that would seem to be under human, under human control in any way, shape, or form is, is war. And the rest, more or less, are beyond our capacity and death will come to us all. But I have the five cowboys of Apocalypse 2.0 and they are, in turn, and not necessarily in that order of, of, of awfulness, uh, capitalism, patriotism, democracy, technology, and entertainment. This <laughs> makes me lots of friends, as you can imagine, in the academic <laughs> society. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it is next to impossible to escape. It is next to impossible to escape those five horsemen, or five cowboys, I should say. And bearing them in mind is useful because you can see where they're in control in one way or another and controlling your life and mine and everyone's. Incredibly right. mind-controlled world that we live in. Mm. It's subtle, it's clever, and it's everywhere. And it's malignant. And it's malignant. Absolutely malignant. Yeah. And it separates us from spirit and, mm. and this surely is one of the great lessons that ancient Egypt has to teach yes. us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the other, the other civilizations and as well. Others, so yeah. really this is an interesting, thank you, Jonathan, um, an interesting way of, of doing this, the venue, because you present the ancient civilization, or the, the, the bones of it anyway, and yeah. the ongoing work, and the very solid ongoing, yeah. ongoing material that we have to work with. And then when we, we talk about it, we put, about, we put it in context yeah. without me doing the Egypt side yeah. of things. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. I like this. Well, let's get uh, let's get into this. I mean, the uh, I I associate you more than any other individual with the the quest to rewrite history. Mm. That's what you're all about, as far as far yeah. as I'm concerned. And you've been right there in the front lines for a very 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 long time. But Don't how did remind it, me. How did it start? <laughs> <laughs> how did how did well, that? I, when did it start for you? Started early, actually. I was never one of these genius kids, you know. That you watch these tiresome little creatures on television. Every week, there's some eight-year-old kid who's standing on his head playing Beethoven's violin sonata while he's eating an ice cream cone. 
and uh, to, to never hear of him again, thank God. And <laughs> some other tiresome little girl, eight years old, singing Verdi absolutely perfectly. So I was never one of those. But what I was, what I was, was I was, in retrospect, I was, I, I was psychologically precocious. And I knew at the age of 13 or so, which was a long time ago, that I'd been brought, that I'd been how, how born. How old are you now, John, if what? you care to share that with, with us? How, how old are you now? You know perfectly well how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not 80 telling. <laughs> 84, you've got, to catch, you've got a ways to go to catch up to me. 84, anyway, yeah. The, I understood that I'd been born into a lunatic asylum, and it was very, very lonely. And by the time I was 19, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the little boy who says the emperor has no clothes. And I did that uh, to my own satisfaction. I started out writing novels and plays and scripts and uh, successfully in that they were published or produced, mostly anyway. Um, but they never made me any money, which is probably a good thing in a way because I'd be sitting at home in a McMansion somewhere or another, not driving all the way into New York in this horrible rain, talking to a few hundred people for a few bucks. <laughs> but seriously, that stayed with me. And then I learned to my dismay that being the little kid, I wrote a story, what was it? I forget where it was published. Was it Nova? That was the magazine put out by Guccione in, in the 70s. Good magazine. Um, and it was called The Emperor's New Clothes Continued. And it's what happens when the emperor gets to back to the palace. And there's all of this, the, the wheels of empire are put into motion. And everybody gets together to prove that the, empire, that the emperor's new clothes are real. And everybody in the whole empire conspires or takes, happily engages in the conspiracy, d either design, well, as I say, designing, producing, marketing, and advertising the emperor's new clothes. And the little kid is, by a philosophical ruse, which is absolutely a testament to what modern fossil philosophy has become, is declared a non-person who doesn't exist and therefore cannot be disproved. And the emperor's new clothes are real, but the little child doesn't exist. And in the end, there's even an upside to that because when winter comes, only he stays warm. So anyway, that was my parable of the emperor's new clothes. And then one thing led to another, I was living on Ibiza in the island. You used to, you, you used to live in, uh, in Ibiza, Ibiza, in, in, Ibiza, Ibiza, in yeah. southern Spain. Yeah. Yes, um, that was Great again, hippie paradise at a certain in, period. In those days, I was pre-hippie, but the, the, it, was, it, was, it was an effort to be there and get any work done, but right. I did manage one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about um, Schwaller's one line that sparked ah, that it all. Ah, one line. You did, I was going to mention that because you made it sound as though I invented this, and I didn't. I was. I got interested first. Well, my first my first nonfiction book was called The Case for Astrology. I, I was enough interested in it to write a big book on it, getting putting together all of the. Um, direct and indirect evidence that there was something to it. <clears throat> but that led through another series of strange synchronicities or coincidences, except there aren't coincidences, uh, that led me to the Gurdjieff work. And then... Now, G.I. Gurdjieff. G.I. Gurdjieff. Well, there's only one. Put up <laughs> your hands if you haven't heard of G.I. Gurdjieff. Yeah. A lot. A lot of, a lot well, of people have. what you do. And I hadn't heard of G.I. Gurdjieff until yeah. I met John Anthony West. Well, if you uh, And I didn't read Gurdjieff until very recently, although really? John continuously urged me to do so. Yeah, Finally, yeah. I'm about 60% into Beelzebub's into, Tales oh, to his grandson. Did grandpa. you start off with that? I did, yeah. Not with Uspensky? No. As, as directed. Yeah. Uh, well, you shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't start off by trying to read Gurdjieff. It's like taking your first driving lesson in a Ferrari. You do not want to do that. Start off with his most brilliant pupil, uh, P.D. Uspensky, which is spelled O-U-S-P-E-N-S-K-Y, uh, a book called In Search of the Miraculous, which will talk about Gurdjieff's system, which was, I mean, what attracted me so much about it, it in a way, it, it's like all of the other genuine spiritual systems. 
The difference is that it was designed to be practiced in the lunatic asylum, and I knew a lot about the lunatic asylum. Gurdjieff called it the pain factory. It is not for everyone. It just plain isn't, but it's maybe for more people than given the number of people that raise their hands not knowing about it, and half of the others were just ashamed to do that. So that's a lot of people who didn't, had never heard of Gurdjieff. But it was, the difference was when I, when I read him first, he was the only person that I'd come across posthumously, he died in 49. He was the only person I'd come across who was as contemptuous of Western civilization as I was. The difference was that he knew how to live in it, and I didn't anyway, not very well. Yeah. And I spent much of the last 40 years, I guess, learning to live in it reasonably well. Or anyway, learning to live in I the can. lunatic asylum of yeah, our with, society, really. Without being one of them. Without actually being a lunatic, yeah. yeah. So anyway, that, that led me, uh, nine years in Ibiza had gotten all ruined. Um, and I knew that when I got there, I, was, I, was, I could see it happening. And uh, to begin with, and, and I had a novel published, which is almost a film on a couple of occasions, but it wasn't. And in doing the first scholarly book, The, the Case for Astro Astrology, I came across the work of this amazing Frenchman with the unpronounceable name R.A. Chouallère de Lubix. And it was his work, I, I could tell, I had, I had to learn French in order to read the book and then travel all the way across London every day because it was the only copy I could find was in the British Museum library where you couldn't take books out. So I had to go there to access it with the dictionary by my side and at the end I could understand Schwaller well enough to transmit it. That's the symbolist Egypt that you, those of you who come on my trip, which this would be about 20 trips, I guess, worth of people there. Everyone's going to come on a trip. Um, this is, this was Schwaller, and Schwaller was talking about ancient Egypt and their belief, I would say not belief, but understanding, that their civilization went back much, much, much further into the back, into the past. And he wrote a long essay on this based mostly on the Greco-Roman text. That's around the time of Caesar. And, and Jesus, and he went into all kinds of texts and so on and, and built a case for the, for the probability, the probable reality of this older stage of Egyptian civilization. And then at the end, almost as a throwaway line, he said, oh yes, and of course, in French, he said, the, 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 the Great Sphinx of Giza shows unmistakable signs of aquatic erosion, water weathering. And I realized when I read that, that that was the game changer, that all the rest was a scholarly argument, like arguments over Shakespeare or arguments over a passage in the Bible. There are better and worse arguments, but none of it really amounts to science. And um, I realized that this was, if you could get, if you could get the backup for it, this could, this could rewrite history in and of itself, because here was the, arguably the greatest statue on the, on the face of the earth, and perhaps even more to the point, the temples on either side of it, and I, by now I'd, I'd, I'd been to Egypt, or anyway, I'd done a lot of study, and the temples alongside it, which, which are built of stones, the ones that, sort of, the sort of stones that Graham was showing, but these are whole temples full of them, still in reasonably good shape, and these stones weighed 75, 100, 150, 200 tons, Slotted in. If I can just add sure. to that, the, the Sphinx is excavated from solid bedrock. The core body of the Sphinx was created by cutting a deep trench around it in the bedrock. But that trench in the bedrock of the Giza Plateau, they didn't waste that. They took the material there and they cut it up into just enormous blocks of stone, certainly many of them in excess of 100 tons, yeah. and they raised them up in front of the Sphinx. So we can say that the Sphinx and the temples do date from the same period. And then here's Schwaller saying water erosion on the Sphinx. So, so the, I could see that, the, that this was all going to fit together if somebody was, if I could find the geologists to verify that the Sphinx was weathered by water, and I had plenty of clues to that, but I'm not a geologist and nobody would listen to me. So it took a long time, and how much time do we have? We have uh, an hour. Oh, you have plenty of time. Um, this is a fun bit of the story. <laughs> um, 
Finally, I, I got friendly with, with a, pr a guy who taught English at Boston University, who had been teaching English at the University of Cairo in Egypt. And there he'd got acquainted with Symbolist Egypt and my work in Schroller. And we were having dinner one day, and he said, is there anything I can do for my academic position to try and get more people interested in Symbolist Egypt? And without even thinking twice about it, I said, sure, find me an open-minded geologist to look into this whole Sphinx theory. And then I laughed, and he said, what are you laughing? And I came out with my line. That's when I invented that line, that finding an open-minded scientist is like finding a fundamentalist Christian who loves his enemies. And he, he said, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. So he wouldn't tell me the name of this. He said he's young, but he's got four or five, he's got four technical books already published. And you don't handle, you stay out of this. You're too incendiary, let me handle this. Years went by. And a couple of years, I keep asking him, well, he's so very cautious, he's interested, he, he wonders. Anyway, then finally he said, well, listen, he's, he's up for tenure, so he doesn't want to do anything. He doesn't, I can't tell you his name, but then I realized, of course, if you're up to tenure and they think you're, as soon as you say lost civilization, everyone thinks, in quackademia, everyone thinks, ah, the A word and Atlantis. So. I understood that that was the case. Finally, he was, he was actually up for tenure. <clears throat> and then he said, okay, so we had a, he said, let's, let's do a, uh, a, a talk at Boston University. So we arranged that for faculty, faculty and, uh, and friends. And I said, okay, um, I will do that. So we, we did that, in fact. And that went over quite well. Some of the faculty were, shaking their heads, and a lot of the students were, that, that's just pretty cool. And long and short of it was the chalk. Finally, we rustled up a few pennies and got him over there. And initially, he just couldn't believe, because it was so obvious that it was water weathering. Let's just say a bit, a bit about Robert Schock. So Robert Schock is a professor of geology at, yes. at Boston University. Geology, geophysicist, PhDs in both yeah. from Yale. So yeah. it's about he's as super good. qualified. And, yeah. and, uh, also right. open-minded. And well, he was one of those who was open-minded. Well, you had to prod him a bit. And in fact, when he first got into the, this is another point I wanted to raise with you. When we first got into the Sphinx enclosure, and I'm not sure if we got in there legally or used the, what works even better in Egypt is a bit of bakshish yeah. and got ourselves in there. And he looked around, everybody else sees the Sphinx, this enormous, unbelievable brooding statue looking out at the horizon. And everybody normally sees the Sphinx, not shock, shock, shock saw the rocks, particularly of the enclosure wall. And he said, wow, he said, these rocks look like they're hundreds of thousands of years old. And then said, don't quote me on that. And which I wouldn't for years, I would keep that quiet actually. But that was his, that was his educated phd geological, geophysical reaction to the enclosure wall of the Sphinx, this fantastic eroded surface. And one thing led to another. Uh, finally, uh, I mean, it, we'd be, we would under there under false circumstances, as it were. Anyway, we couldn't use that as official to break the news. And so we scratched together a bit more money, and now this, when I go into this, it'll, it'll, it'll somewhere in an autobiography. You can imagine how easy that's going to be to write, because then just ramble on forever and just take out the us and the us. Um, and we, 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 we scratched together enough money and we got permission to go in there and use the seismographs, and we didn't get permission did to use Did that permission involve Zahi Hawass? That sure did involve okay. Zahi Hawass, yeah. That's, this is going to be called the Book of Boris, actually, <laughs> right. because between the two of these guys, 
I mean, that, 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 if I get an opportunity to do, do this as a film script, it's going to be a, a great fun because it makes Raiders of the Lost Ark <laughs> look like I would look like a, the, the Boris Roman. was Boris Said. Who Boris, was there that's right, you, yeah. the famous Boris Said. But, so Zahi Hawass actually gave Genghis Khan the keys to the Sphinx. Then that's right. He actually <laughs> did. Yes, yes, he did. And now we're now we're okay. Yeah. Zahi and myself, we buried He's the hatchet a long ago. Yeah. Very curious character, mm. as you know. Yes. And anyway. So then we broke this news to the, to the, because now I had chalk behind me, to the GSA, that's Geological Society of America's annual meeting in San Diego. This was 91, that's 25 years ago. And that's the, that's, you might say it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the Super Bowl of, of geology. Anybody with anything new or anything good or challenging to say uh, presents it at the GSA. And Chuck and I spent, a whole afternoon at my place, trying to make this sound boring, so that we didn't so we didn't scare them away, but they still understood that there was new, there was the possibility of, of news through this, and sure enough, we were the we were the really we were the the um, we were the hit of the show. I mean, with this New York Times and all the scientific magazines. I remember the m massive coverage. Yeah, I mean, we hadn't even met then yet, yeah. but yeah, Sphinx it was huge. Sphinx could be coverage. much older than yeah, experts well, say. That's and right, and uh, that really pissed the Egyptologists off. Oh, they were furious <laughs> about this, and in fact, this is where we come to in the story. The the science editor of the Boston Globe, Chuck teaches at Boston University, interviewed us by telephone. He wasn't there personally. First, he interviewed Shock, and Shock was his usual polite academic self who explained carefully what it was and why they were that angry. And then he interviewed me, and he said, Well, you know, the, the geologists are all in favor of this. What gets them so furious? Because you can't imagine what the things that they were calling us. And I said, Well, look, this is about the weathering patterns in rocks. And when it comes to the weathering patterns in rocks, the opinions of Egyptologists and archaeologists is no more valid than the opinions of proctologists. And he published this and, 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 the, and the Boston Globe. And this did not have the conciliatory effect upon the archaeology department of Boston University. And, and there was a, a furious character assassination of Shaka. It was really awful by this woman who doesn't know that we're coming at her pretty quickly. Um, and she wrote this scandalous character assassination of Shock. And I said, oh, Shock, you can't let him get away with that. This is, OK, it's an in-house Boston BU paper. But still, you know, you can't let her get away with it. Oh, no, he said, let it slide. It'll pass. And I said, well, you do mind if I write her. And so she said, no, you go ahead, long as it's just from you and not from the university. So I did, and I said, you know, I understand you guys took umbrage at uh, this comparison of Egyptologists and archaeologists to proctologists. And I said, I've got to tell you that the proctologists didn't like it either. They, 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 they said their job was to cure sick assholes. They didn't like, didn't like being compared to them. <laughs> That's the end of that chapter, but it's not the beginning of the next chapter, which comes along sometime soon, I think. Well, I mean, if you're, you're there, it's 1991, you're, you're proposing that probably the single most famous object of the ancient world, mm -hmm. the Sphinx, which we have been taught in schools and universities and the media that the Sphinx is supposed to be 4,500 years old, uh, linked to a known civilization and culture, and suddenly you're saying, uh-uh, no, it's thousands of years older than that. Actually, that throws everything up into, the, right. uh, up into the air. It's not just a matter of the Sphinx. No. Everything we think about That's the right. origins of human civilization is questioned by that, and a lot of people have vested interest in preserving the status oh, well, quo of the past. They're, they're, break. <laughs> it's actually, the vested interests are, one, on the practical side, on the professional side, but more on the personal side. It means that they put all of their time into these PhDs, decades probably, 
there, I mean, let's face it, as, a, as an academic, there's, there's not much money in it, and there's very rarely is there any kind of fame in it. So the ego of an academic, by and large, is concerned with, is, is involved with his or her, in certain cases, his or her ego. And along comes a guy from out of left field, and one gangly tall geologist with all the credentials from Yale, but this is Egyptology, not archaeology, and archaeology, not, not geology, so what do they care? And telling them that they're, everything that they've studied and that they're teaching poor kids who don't know any better is wrong. So they're not going to like you very much. And not only that, but it gets picked up by the media and, right, and becomes a big story, which they yeah. can't just shove under the carpet. They cannot do anymore. They could do that in the old days. Before the internet. What? Yeah, 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 yeah before the internet. So one thing led to another, and we had this Charlton Heston big video, which was a huge success. didn't make any money because my partner, Boris Said. The famous Boris stole $150,000 out of the till. Ouch. So he couldn't go back. To You're the referring to the mystery invested. of the Sphinx. Yeah, the, the mystery the, of the, the Sphinx. The yeah. NBC, NBC documentary, yeah, yeah. Uh, which really took your, your work oh, yeah. and, and spread it to a massive, yeah, massive yeah. audience. Millions and millions of people who unfortunately didn't pay anything to watch it. <laughs> what money we got was stolen by Boris. Oh, dear. To, to take to get women he was interested in into bed, which isn't the worst way to spend money. Boris not, was sort of my uh, money. <laughs> <laughs> Boris was sort of the producer of, of the show. He was the producer. And, and he was a rally driver. I remember being terrifyingly yeah. driven up a sand dune in Egypt by Boris Said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he'd been a he'd been a, he'd been a Formula One driver uh, for Ferrari. This guy was not physically afraid of anything, um, unfortunately. And you know, that's where, the, that's where the money went, and, but I, still, without Boris, it wouldn't have happened. I never would have made this and happen the documentary had a huge impact. Huge. It was presented by Charlton Heston, as yeah. I recall, yeah. yeah. It was not exactly my politics, but No, but he, but he put it, he, you know, he, yeah, he, he put it at that level of, right, of a right, superstar. Right. And he liked it. I mean, this is the funny thing, the righties like these, these kinds of ideas, and it's the lefties, in fact, who are, the, yeah. who are, who are our, our, our actual enemies uh, yes. in, in yeah. this quest. Yeah. Anyway, the, so that, that made the whole thing public, and it's been going on ever since. We've been collecting the evidence, and now Gobekli Tepe is the smoking gun because that they date at 10,000 BC or older. Mm. By the way, it is older because this is not goes for sure it didn't go up in one Absolutely. fell soup. And the part that they've excavated is the lower part. Exactly. So generally speaking, yeah. when they're doing something like this, whatever they're doing first is the highest. Yeah. And we know and that large. 50 times as much is still lying it's under still the It's still there. I didn't think it was that what kind of What secrets does it have to reveal? Yes. Really? And, yeah. and what are the other hills that are around there like? Because yeah. yeah. they all look like hills. It, that, that's another interesting study coming up there. So you went to Gobekli Tepe when? Yeah. You, you went with shock. Mm. And what year David, was that? David, must have been about six years ago. Okay. Six years, before they covered all this stuff up. I know. So it they was... Put a horrible was, roof over it now. now but what, but was your, what was your feeling when you got there, when you saw the site, had a look around? What, what, what are you thinking? Put, talk us through your process when you're there. Well, that, that this was correct. I mean, there was no... There was no way in, in which it could be other than it was. The fill was the fill. It had been filled. You could see that. Mm. They dated the fill. They, couldn't, they, they didn't make a mistake mm. dating the fill to 8,000 BC. Mm. And Schmidt himself, who you met, who was, as archaeologists go, a pretty open-minded guy. Mm -hmm. Pretty open-minded, I should say, in certain regards. He was not into the astronomy yeah. or the cosmology of it, which has, has been handled, I think, very adequately by by Laird Scranton, mm -hmm. and, but he, was, he, would, he would stand by the dating, and Chuck, who was the most careful guy in the world, couldn't fault the way, the, the various methods they used for the dating. So there it is, and actually, Graham, this was a, a point in your talk that I wanted to, that I wanted to bring up. They're all about their hunter-gatherers and stuff. You know, these are guys who, I mean, most of these people have never built a dry stone wall in their lives mm. or done anything creative whatsoever. I mean, they couldn't write an advertising jingle, which in fact is difficult to write. But these are very uncreative people looking at 
the most creative people that ever lived. And so they haven't a clue as to what goes in. And also they don't know what it's like to be a hunter-gatherer because they don't hunt and they don't fish and they don't gather. Right. They go to the supermarket like everybody else. And, and they, why should anybody learn to plant and till the land when all you have to do is go outside the palisades or whatever it is that keeps you safe and shoot a rhinoceros yeah. or whatever it is and you have food Excellent for the point. winter. In fact, hunter-gatherer lifestyles are very satisfying and, yeah. and spiritually nurturing and, and, exactly. uh, and ample, in fact. Yeah, why should they do anything other than shoot their rhinoceros? There aren't that many of them yeah. and plenty of rhinoceroses. Mm. When they get tired of rhinoceros, they can shoot an elephant. But there's, uh, hunter-gathering is great. Yeah. Who, who in their right mind wouldn't hunter-gather? Mm. Same applies, you know, the rough and crude conditions. Well, we don't know that. I mean, they have their bear skins and they have plenty of stuff to wear and they have plenty to eat. Yes. And, and we know that the upper Paleolithic cave artists, who definitely were hunter-gatherers, were creating this transcendent art 30, well, 40,000 years ago. That was my other point, actually, yeah. that it's unnecessary. It should have been unnecessary if there were such a thing as a, as a genuinely respectable and open-minded yeah, I almost hate to use the word open-minded bunch of scientists and scholars out there because the cave art itself, and now with Chauvet, that pushes it back to 31,000 31, BC before yeah. you had Altamira and Lasco, which they were dating at 17,000, 19,000 BC. These are geniuses who are painting yes. these, these bare, Absolutely. curved, unfinished walls in such a way that they were heightening the perspective and all the rest. You didn't need anything other than that yeah. to prove that it's a sophisticated civilization. Yes. They think that illumination comes from light, electricity, and it has nothing to do with any ways. Put it this way, illumination might, but enlightenment doesn't come from light bulbs. But I do think there's one point, which is, which is that um, hunt, hunter-gatherer societies don't generate surpluses to a large extent. They are, they are living often very comfortably from day to day. It's an untold story of hunter-gatherers that actually in famines in South Africa that have, that have occurred, it's the agriculturalists who starve. The hunter-gatherers are just fine in, yeah, for example, Botswana, Namibia. Yeah, they, they, ah. they, 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 they do fine. But I suppose the one difference is that an agricultural society can set aside and store surpluses, which can then uh, the argument, at any rate, mm. is that it can free people to develop specialist skills in, in areas like stoneworking and so on, and that's the explanation of yeah, Stonehenge. Yeah, but this is baloney too, because look at, look at those caves. This is at a time when this, the, there isn't that going sure. on. Sure, and somebody and was having time to create these astonishing works of art. Yeah. Good mean, point. So Picasso learned to, to paint bulls from, I think, Altamira or Lasco or one of those places, and then along comes Chauvet, which is exponentially superior yes. to the other ones, and that they date at 31,000 BC. Indeed. And they're still talking all this garbage about that this may have to make archaeologists change their minds and blah, blah, blah. Mm. Well, they don't have any minds to change. It should be easy. But <laughs> this, is, this is what is frustrating. <laughs> um, I think Graham's more frustrated by this stuff than I am. My, my Gurdjieff training teaches me that whoever and whatever presses your buttons is your master. Yeah. And I personally do not like being a slave. I work very hard at not getting my buttons pushed. To fairly, with some success, I must say. Yeah, yeah. So let's move on slightly. Uh, why is it important to get history right? Why is it important to dig out these facts that are so unwelcome to the official arbiters of history. Why, why, does it, why does it matter? Why should we care, really, if the Sphinx is much older, uh, if there was a, a, a deeply wise and, and um, spiritually sophisticated civilization in the remote past? Why should we care? Well, we, we wouldn't... There would no, be no reason to care if we had a civilization of our own worth calling a civilization. Right. But we don't. We have a, we have a fraudulent religion, which they don't even, which they call progress, and I call the church of progress, um, that is absolutely pernicious, both on the personal and on the cosmic level. Mm. We're in the process of destroying ourselves with all our stupid ass technology and getting nothing for it, 
I mean, the five, the five cowboys explain it, practically everybody, even in this room, will be spending much of their time, I bet, doing stuff that does not in any way enhance or feed your soul or, your, or anything other than pay the rent. I, I take bets on that. Mm -hmm. The number of us who manage to actually make a living out of doing what we want is very small. Mm. And usually, as I said, it's great cost. Yeah. So that's why. Otherwise, mm. if we had a civilization of our own, no, why mm. bother? Mm -hmm. Then it's just an academic question. But if you could, if you could pick the lessons. What could we, what can we learn from ancient Egypt? And I agree with you that ancient Egypt is a, well, it's one of your, one of your famous lines that, that ancient Egypt, ancient Egypt is not a development. It's, it's a, a it's a legacy. Yes. So they are they are bringing down knowledge from a remoter past. Mm. But what what would be the key elements of that knowledge which we could apply to our society today and somehow make things better if that were possible? Well, I guess it, this, is, this is where the Dead Saints Chronicles comes, comes in, mm -hmm. that probably in very old day, old ancient times, the hunter-gatherers, so what? They, chopped, they, you know, they had stone axes and they chipped away at mm. things. I mean, you see some of the things that they've done that they date very old. They've done this, mm. I don't know, you probably saw it, that Turkish bracelet sure. that dated to 8,000 BC made of obsidian that employs a very complicated geometry yep. involved. Whoa, this is 8,000 BC. Um, and, and what we're talking about then with, with these ancient societies is that they're probably, when they talk about the Garden of Eden, it's probably not a physical place. It probably is a condition or a spiritual state, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. And these people are living in something approaching a state of grace or something like that. Right. And we just have we have no access to that. I mean, yeah. we can't even imagine yeah. what it is unless we live with yeah. the Aborigines or, or the. Or the so when you cast your mind back, I remember we've had we've had conversations about the Sphinx many times, and mm. I know that you are open to the possibility that the Sphinx is even much older. Much older, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced of it. I think you're I think you're persuaded by the astronomical argument, mm. but you make the point that the age of Leo recurs every twenty six thousand yeah. years. Yeah. yeah, and. And the Egyptian texts themselves, the Palermo Stone and the Turin Papyrus, that talk about these earlier periods and give the regnal years of these supposedly mythical kings. And when you put them all together, which is what Schroller did, you get 34, 36,000 years. So we're closing in on an early, early age of Leo. Right. Shock's initial reaction of, wow, these rocks look like they're hundreds of thousands of years old. That's and that's not from a guy who exaggerates much. I mean, that's from, mm. from a cautious guy just taking a look at this. Yeah. So this is one of the things really that we want to do is to get together a, a panel of mm. geologists to go over and study that, which we've never had. We've never had the opportunity or the money to yeah. get the permissions. Now we think we can get them because now Shock finally, 20 years later, has his own university agreeing that maybe he's worth supporting. Mm -hmm. So not in money, so not how many money, but in terms of prestige, all of a sudden, the university is saying to hell with you, to the archaeologist, right. and, and is being supportive. So maybe. But, but what's at stake is, as I said, is philosophical and immaterial, as it were. It's not, it's not that it's going to help us make more money or anything of the sort, at whatever it is that we do, whatever our jobs are. It's that it changes the whole way you approach your day on an individual and on a collective basis. Sure. That there's something worth striving, that actually worth striving for that just isn't the mortgage or the, you know, mm. the payments on the car, but that is, for lack of a better word, soul fulfilling and soul expanding. Yes, yes. Something of the sort. When, when you consider this, the, uh, at, at, at the heart of this is a notion of a lost civilization. But listening to you now, you're making very valid points about hunter-gatherer societies that, that they, they rightly and properly also deserve to be called a civilization. Mm. But when you look back on the, on the notion of a lost civilization, are you envisaging something uh, technologically advanced in the way that we are, we regard ourselves as, certainly? Are you envisaging a a complex 
structured, urban-based, the, the, the whole suite of things that are associated with the word civilization today, or are you thinking along hunter-gatherer lines? Clarify your, your thinking on that. Both, actually. Both. And one doesn't, as you pointed out, when you had the, the, um, the it was, a, it was a, the rainforest yeah. Indians, and who's to say that we're more civilized than they were? It's, it's what goes on inside them. Yeah. Yeah, really? Exactly. So, and, and you could also, we're so used to seeing it manifest in terms of buildings or mm. sophistic, mm. what we call sophistication, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, uh, whole civilizations could last for thousands of years expressing their deepest, their deepest feelings and their deepest knowledge in dance, and they wouldn't leave any, tr any mm. trace of it whatsoever. But yet, members of those civilizations would have been deeply fulfilled yeah. and, and, and had meaningful and purposeful yeah. lives. Yeah. Yeah. But then, uh, if we consider the Sphinx, and mm. we consider those 100-ton blocks that are shifted in front yeah. of the Sphinx and turned into two extraordinary temples, that, that surely involves something other than just manpower, or, or what? What does it involve? What's, I what, don't know. what does it come I to? I don't does know. It, it certainly involves manpower in some way, shape, or form, since men did it, and not machines and not aliens. At least I don't think aliens. Um, poor aliens, they get a bad rap all the time. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, aliens. Yeah, let's go light on the aliens. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I know some people who I think are aliens. <laughs> they're, they're nice, and I yeah. like them. I just don't think they built the pyramids yeah. for the Sphinx. They, I don't know. Um, whatever impels them to do that, mm. at that stage, you know, we're now talking, right? We're talking at least 10,000 years ago, at maybe least. more. Yeah. Prior, probably, to the Younger Dryas. We're talking about yeah. what's going on in Ice Age times. Yeah. And they're wheeling and dealing around these huge blocks. I mean, maybe, maybe it's just they're having fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, seriously. But doesn't, the way it imply, we the doesn't it imply some kind of, to use the word, technology or, yeah. or, or something? And are you open to the notion that, that the ancients had perhaps a different way of manipulating matter than we do? What almost, do you um, it almost seems a prerequisite because it doesn't seem possible with anything that we know about moving and cutting stones yeah. to do that. Mm. I mean, you said you were talking about not being able to put a piece of paper between blocks of stone you know, bigger than that piano. Yeah. I mean, a lot bigger than the piano, yeah. and you can't yeah. put a piece of paper between them. Yeah. Well, it raises more questions than it, than, it, um, than it answers, because A, how did they do this? That's a complete mystery. And then, why did they even want to do this mm -hmm. to that level of perfection? That's another huge mystery. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, the more, and the more you get into these things, the more, how do you say, the more wonderful the mystery becomes, because you, at first, you don't get it. I mean, you, unless you've, unless you've, uh, even if you've studied a lot and read a lot of the books, you can't get it till you see it in front of your nose. And then almost every day you're looking at things and say, well, God, uh, how did they possibly do this? And then this question hard on its heels is, why would they want to? And it's something probably analogous to it that is, that's commonplace. I mean, why does a runner try to run, you know, kill himself to break 0.2 tenths of a second off so that he's faster than the other guy. Mm. Something of that sort, except probably not an ego involved. I don't think at a certain level an ego's involved in that either, or the mountain climbers or the, mm. the people who are doing all, all of these. People who want to challenge themselves. Who profoundly. want to challenge themselves in some way or another. And we do it to this day, but we don't do it in concert. No. Um, to produce works of, works of art. Yeah. I sometimes wonder if, if the thing that we call progress, technology, civilization, um, is really a, a regression, um, that, there are, that there are faculties of the human mind, I'm getting a bit woo-woo here, but no. psi power, which we talk of te telepathy, telekinesis, these, these kind of things, perhaps they are native faculties of the human mind, but perhaps they've lapsed with this huge technological imposition that we, that we are so grateful for, but at the same time enslaves us. No, I'm 100% agreed with that, yeah. 
I think I think that's the case. Yeah. Um, actually, a couple of funny funny little stories. Schroller talks about I don't know if it's his experience or not, or if it's Marcel Griol. Anyway, it's about 1912 or so, and the missionaries are trying to convert the the uh, the locals wherever they are in Africa, somewhere there with the tribes, local tribesmen into into good Christians, and he tells. The chieftain, you know, tomorrow, look above, he knows that there's a plane scheduled, a mail plane to go ahead, overhead, and you'll see flying men. And the, the chieftain is very interested in that. And so he's there at the appointed time, and he looks at the plane going overhead, and he says, bah, machinery. Right. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, so what? It's a machinery. Yeah. I feel, you know, roughly the same way yeah. about space. I mean, there are some that. accounts, I, I forget exactly where I saw them now, of, of these huge blocks being sung into mm, place. There's a Tibetan, that Swedish guy, yeah. writing in a German newspaper about them lifting Lifted, the Actually, an eyewitness account sound. from yeah, the 1920s yeah, right. yeah. of raising a, a yeah. substantial boulder up into right. the sky. And maybe something like that would, would explain what we see around the Sphinx. Maybe, but the, the, again, you, 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 you're left with the question of why. Why? Why would they want to do it that yeah. way? Because of the beauty of the thing, the majesty uh, the, of the thing. Well, or the power that it, it, yeah. it has still. I mean, when, this is the thing. You go to these, there's not much that's intact nowadays of, of, of ancient sacred art, but when it's more or less intact, as it is in Egypt, and it is in certain the mosques and the temples of of, of, uh, of India, and you've seen enough of it mm -hmm. in your things that that these things these things connect you mm -hmm. to to something higher within you, and maybe they built these. Maybe it was in in a way. I'm just ballparking it, but maybe it was was their way of counteracting a. A descending force, in other words, a kind of a setian force that was that was making them more material, and this was a way of s spiritualizing that very right. that very proclivity, that 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 yeah. that pull toward toward the material. Maybe you've spoken of symbolist Egypt as a well, given the flood of technology and the the very real possibility of modern civilizations literally imploding and, and mm. self-destructing. You've spoken of symbolist Egypt as a kind of arc that can yeah. carry us forward through that well, flood. Take that a little further. Let's, let's okay, more well, about that. Yeah, I think one of the lines that, that symbolist Egypt is, is the blueprint for an arc. It's, it's, we wouldn't, we're not going to mummify pharaohs again, or have pharaohs, probably not, or any of those other things that, that they did have. But the, the principles that are embodied in their so-called gods, who are not gods, their principles, and the interaction between them is their mythology, which is full of astronomy and astrology and all sorts of things like that. And so it stands, I, I, I would say, as a model, in other words, if they could do it, we could do it. Mm -hmm. But we'd go at it in a different way and we'd do different things. But let's say the motivation would be the same, mm -hmm. which is to access those higher powers that we do, in fact, have, in, have within us. And I mean, to reconnect, you know, from, reconnect to spirit. Yes. Yeah. I would yeah. think so, just as your ayahuasca and mine, ayahuasca experiences. Yeah, I talked that. John into going and doing some ayahuasca sessions in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't have to do much talking, actually. No, I didn't. <laughs> Off he went like a rocket. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so, so, but, so, so this whole thing, the symbolist Egypt adds that, adds that philosophical side to it, which otherwise just looks like is mostly science, and it's good science, to overthrow our picture of the past, but the reason to overthrow it is that the present is such a hell house. Yeah. It's yeah. such a, you know, it's such a brothel. It's a hell house desperately trying to disguise itself as a paradise. That's right. Yeah. failing. That, that's, that's actually pretty good. That's, yeah. that's, about, yeah. that's about what it is. Yeah. So that actually adds, I mean, there's a, a, there's a reason for doing all of this, and it's not just to make fools of all the academics, which is fun in its own right, but it <laughs> didn't lead anywhere all by itself, but it's, it's important 
to, it's very important as far as I'm concerned, to, um, to disempower them. Yeah. Very because they important. have a stranglehold yeah. on how people should think. I think yeah. this is the main, the mm -hmm. main problem. And it's something that we don't always realize clearly, because it seems a universal good to have an education system and we're taught things, but actually from birth really, or certainly from the age of one or two, actually from birth, we're being channeled into particular lines mm. of thought, yeah. uh, which, which automatically constricts and limits our, our potential to think otherwise. Yes, and the purpose of school, once you, you know, they, they drop the ax on you and, and they make you go there, is designed to, to stifle your creativity. Mm. The first things they cut when they're looking for budgets and stuff like that is to cut the, is to cut the creativity yeah. out, the, cut out the arts and concentrate on this stupid economics and yeah. finance and yeah. phony science and all yeah. the rest. Victor Hugo talked about the strongest thing in the world. Uh -huh, yeah, what is that? <laughs> yes, well, he said there's one thing stronger than all the armies in the world, and that is an idea whose time has come. Sounds great, and it's great, good line. Um, but what Victor Hugo didn't think of, and probably didn't occur to him, is one, the idea whose time has come is not necessarily a good idea. Fascism is an idea whose time came, and it's still lurking around the corner. Even worse, the second strongest thing in the world is an idea whose time has not yet gone. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're dealing with on a daily basis, on a minute by minute by basis, because all of the armies in the world, literally or de facto, are, are in, enthralled to or, or are employed to or are pledged to defending the idea whose time has not yet gone. That's our problem. Yeah. And if we don't realize that, we've got a problem. There's yeah. a lot, you know, there's a lot of the new agey stuff out there. You rub two crystals together and we're all going to be it's one also again. Easy, well, yeah. we're not all going to be one again. Not, yeah. with, not without a lot of work yeah. from a lot of people. So there's this, um, it's kind of a battle of ideas in a way between the idea whose time has come or should have come and uh, the idea whose time is not yet over. And I think you and I have found ourselves frequently um, in the firing line. Of oh, that. yeah. Well, we put ourselves there. I don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> we volunteered. <laughs> really it, volunteered. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And if we live long enough, our time will come. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so do you, do you sense this, that there is a real shift underway? Mm. That things yeah, are, things I do. are altering? I do. It's a, it's a bit difficult. You have to be careful about this. Because here we have everybody here and they're all enjoying themselves. At least most of them are. Or they're too polite to leave anyway. Um, but they seem to be enjoying themselves. But, you know, there are a lot more people, wherever the hell they're playing something or another tonight, who couldn't care less yeah. about what we're talking about. Yeah. So we are numerically, there's quite a number of us, statistically, we almost don't exist. Yes. But it, only, it doesn't take a majority to turn things around. And no. as Mark Twain said, whenever I find myself siding with the majority, I know it's time to reconsider my position. <laughs> <laughs> this is one Great. of my favorite quotes. Great piece of advice, <laughs> actually, yeah. 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 So, but yeah, it, it, seems to be, it seems to be turning, or could turn, it, it needs its, you might say, it's sort of a, I, uh, what was the, wait, the, the Uncle Tom's, it needs its Uncle Tom's Cabin moment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where a single book, at least this is the legend, really brought on the whole Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War, which is a horrible war, but which mm -hmm. nevertheless did turn things around, to a certain extent anyway, at least here in Dubfakistan. Mm. And Dumb you know Pakistan, that? that's another yeah. John West. No, that's uh, not my, that's not my not original yours. one. Not my original one. Okay. When Bush stole the second election, um, <laughs> somebody, somebody published a map, and I tried to find out who it was, and I couldn't track it to its source. And the map, what I did is I adjusted the nomenclature. The, the map had the red states in America. It was a map of North America. And the red states were all in red. And that was marked Dumbfuckistan. And the blue states and Canada 
were marked in blue, and that was either the United States of Canada, which is pretty unsatisfactory, unsat or America, as if there was this big, it's, this big a, a, a difference between red states and blue states. And I decided that that, I, that wasn't good, accurate enough. The red states are greater dumb Pakistan, and the blue states are lesser dumb Pakistan, <laughs> but it's all dumb Pakistan. And anybody <laughs> who doesn't think so just has to go back to this last election. Okay. So, <clears throat> I think we should have a few words on the, um, how do I pronounce this, uh, Anupadeshi. Anupadeshi, the, uh, I, uh, the, uh, Tell us what the Anupadeshi the are. The Anupadeshi, oh, that's Paul Roberts, who is a Sanskrit scholar, gave me that. That's the, that's the caste after, I forget what it is, what it's like, the Hindu caste system that goes... Um, Brahmins. It goes Brahmins, uh, uh, warriors, no, yeah, Kshatri Kshatriya, the warriors, the merchants, the servants, the untouchables, and below that there are the unteachables, and that's the Anupadeshi, and this is who we deal with. The untouchables. The These are the unteachables, <laughs> the Anupadeshi. Very nice. And that's what we deal with. Very nice. That is that is what we deal with, and sometimes dealing with them can be can be painful. I, I, you're right, my buttons get pushed easier yeah, than, yeah, than easier yours. Than uh, I, had a, I had a documentary, assassination documentary made about me mm. um, by BBC yeah, that Horizon. Horizon, right, right, right. It was a funny thing, actually. Uh, a friend of mine in TV rang me up. He phoned me at home. And he said, Graham, um, BBC Horizon are going to ask you for an interview. Say no. And six weeks later, they phoned me up, and I said, yes. But I didn't take account of what can happen on the cutting room floor. And that was, a, that was just a huge stitch up, and it was deeply, deeply unpleasant. And it hurt me badly, actually. Yeah, I, yeah. I kind of slumped for, for a while yeah. after that. I've never really seen yeah. you slump, and I know you've taken a lot, of, a lot of pretty heavy blows as well. Yeah, well, I see, um, this is this, if, if you have satirist genes, this stuff is, as I said, it's like the cannibal, you know, the boatload of cannibals <laughs> approaching your island. Sorry, the other way, boatload, boatload of missionaries, missionaries approaching yes. your, your, your island. I, I, I see it all as an opportunity. Yeah. And now, I, I used to not see it as an opportunity because it was very hard to get the word out. But they can get to, okay, a bigger audience maybe, but I can get to a smarter audience and a big one. Mm. And so can you. Yeah. So there's, there's no, and besides, if you let them push the buttons, they, if you let them push your buttons, you lose. You lose, it's yeah, absolutely. as simple as that. I'm, I'm trying to learn that lesson. It's hard to, it's hard Isn't to. Isn't one of the big things that has changed uh, the, the arrival of the internet and this, this huge availability of information? I mean, we used to live in a time, you and I both lived through that time, when information was really channeled through limited number of media, the big newspapers, yeah. the big TV stations, that's where people got their news mm. from. And now it's, now it's radically changed. Oh, yeah. There's been a kind of liberation of yes. information. The downside of that, unfortunately, are the unicorns, mm -hmm. the, you know, the woolly end of the, yeah. the wishy-washy woolly end of the other side of the New Age movement, where yeah. the crystal sniffers and the tree huggers, and they all mean well, but they, they make it that much more difficult yeah. To establish anything that is, that is yes. you know, that follows the rules, as it were. It's not necessarily all the time to, to follow the rules, but you've got to make clear, you've got to know the rules to know which ones to break. Yeah, yeah. If you're doing this sort of in stuff. In a sense, we're in an, almost in an overload of information. I'm, I'm finding now, with, because I, I post quite regularly on, on Facebook, and I mm. might find a story I like, but these days, I am going to check out the background to that story extremely thoroughly before I share it because yeah. there's such a lot of, uh, I mean, bogus information that's put out there. I think the internet is a great good. Mm. I, think it's a, I think it's a wonderful thing. It's allowed communities of ideas to form uh, and, it, and, it, and it's made it impossible for the controlling powers to really suppress information. That happened with my TED talk when they took it offline. I mm -hmm. got fortunately advance yeah, notice for three hours. I put out the word and hundreds of people downloaded it just in yeah. time and then it went out right. there and it blew up in TED's right. face in a massive way. Same thing happened with Rupert actually, with Sheldrake. With Sheldrake, he yeah, got, yeah. He, got, he yeah. got the same Well, the same he, we, were on the same, we were right. at the same event. But he yeah. got the same kind of Absolutely. reaction to it. 
Yeah. yeah. He's too polite, though. <laughs> too yeah, much that's Rupert of, Sheldrake. He's too, too much of a gentleman. Who spoke at the same TED Talk as me. And Rupert, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, uh, the one thing that Rupert and I had in common, actually, mm -hmm. and the one reason why they took our talks down was, was because we considered the possibility that consciousness was not local to the oh, brain. Oh, right. Yeah. That defies a fundamental dogma of materialist reductionist science, which right. is that Consciousness that's the paradigm. is simply an artifact. That's the, that's the church of progress. The paradigm. That's that's its that's one of its central yeah. catechisms. And that's what we say. bumped up against there. Ah, yeah. And that's right. what you've been bumping up against oh, yeah, uh, yeah. all yeah. all your well, life. I but to. so we live in this time of flux and, and transition and change with with um, availability of of new ideas. We have the sense that we are speaking of an idea whose time has come, yet. As you rightly say, the, the, the light that is burning is, is relatively small at the moment. It is. Uh, what's it going to take to trigger this to the next level? What that's, happens? That's the, big that's, the, that's the big question. That's what I was talking about. It needs, it, it, it can use uh, its Uncle Tom's Cabin moment, mm. and you can't predict what that's going to be. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's not. Because you thought it was going to be the Sphinx. Well, could have been, yeah, yeah it and it been, can still be in a sense. But it could have been, but it yeah. wasn't. Yeah. Um, or maybe, I mean, go back to Tepe. Yeah. But this is why I think that uh, I don't know, but that something like the Dead Saints, something like that NDE, mm. that's easy to grasp, as it were. Everyone can grasp it. Yeah. Whereas the other, the lost civilization or the Sphinx or all of that, is primarily intellectual mm -hmm. and you have to be willing and able to at least read or anyway yes. watch the videos or yeah. something of the sort what it will do I, you know what will bring it about i don't know i mean the the one possibility is that they fuck it up to such an extent which they're in the process of doing that mm -hmm. at least a lot of people all of a sudden wake up and say we didn't we didn't bargain for this yeah you let us down the path yeah yeah. But I don't know. Well, there's clearly already, I mean, massive dissatisfaction with the status quo. With yeah, the way but that it's, things not, are. it's not directed toward anything. It doesn't no. have a positive side to it's it. It's just fury. It's just anger for, for good reason, but that doesn't do any good. Yeah. I don't know. Everybody here, go home and tell everybody do you know all about lecture that you saw and that we have to do something and maybe you'll find somebody to talk to or anyway find out who your friends are. I don't know. So where does it where does it lead for for you from from here? What's next for John Anthony West? Well, what's next for Graham Hancock? <laughs> more, what else is there? Like, all you can do is what you do. Yeah, yeah. Right? Just keep on uh, keep on keep, doing it and and, and it. hope it gels in some and, way. You know, it? hope that the mortgage gets paid and yeah. and, and and keep doing it. Yeah. I mean, that's, but that's the bottom the, the bottom the bottom line, I think you and I. Are completely on the same page on this is that is that a fundamental ailment of the so-called civilization mm. that surrounds us today is the complete disconnect from spirit absolutely that that is that is the heart of the matter yep. and we're sitting of course in a church but the mainstream monotheistic faiths aren't really are they providing us with that no it's actually they're part of the problem yeah. Because they're, they are exactly contrary to what their own teaching is, particularly yes. in the West. Yes. Look at these crazies who are running around talking about Jesus and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> who would Jesus bomb next? I saw somebody had a T-shirt. <laughs> and then I saw a T-shirt, somebody had that. Yeah, so they're, they're part of the problem. Yeah. And, and, and they're currying favor, often with exactly the wrong elements of science. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've, the Pope was okay with... He was okay with Darwinian evolution or something quasi or Darwinian evolution. He was all for that. Or was it, wait, it was some, one other thing. He was, he was against something or another, but nevertheless, the virgin birth was fact. Right. <laughs> well, no, Pope, whatever his name is. Right, right. No, you can't say that. It's fact just because you happen to believe it. And that, of course, gains points when it comes to jerks like Dawkins and yes. Dennett and as I call them the co-commandants of the latter day Darwin Jugend. Um, <laughs> That's a, Daniel Dennett and Richard Dawkins. Yeah. Richard Dawkins, the author of The God Delusion and the Selfish and all of Gene that stuff. And all they, of that they crap. feed into those guys with that kind of with they that do. kind of commentary. Yeah. 
they have to be attacked. <laughs> yes. Right straight out, straight yes. forwardly. Yeah. Chuck and, and I have an idea for a couple of books that we want to do actually, mm -hmm. but with me around, it's it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Organization is not one of my strengths. Yes. Anyway. A beautiful adventurous spirit who has explored the world Thank and, you, and raised fundamental questions that I think have touched uh, everybody in ways some people don't even realize. Haven't touched Donald Trump. Haven't touched Donald Trump. <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. Um, on, this, on this question of disconnect from spirit, we, yes. um, we're, we're approaching the time when we need to stop, but we agreed, oh, <laughs> we agreed um, that uh, I would read a passage from ah, the, I from the Asclepius. Yes, yes. John, I, I John suggested this. Um, and uh, it's from the Hermetic uh. texts, and it's a text. Uh, These purport to be dialogues between the god Thoth, the god of wisdom, who the ancient Egyptians called Hermes, um, and his uh, pupils. This is a particular dialogue. Sorry, the Greeks called him Hermes. Thank you for being polite. Um, Jehuti, yes. Um, dialogues uh, in which Thoth Hermes is uh, uh, in dialogue with certain pupils. And this is this dialogue with Asclepius, and it contains uh, a passage called The Lament. And I think that does, I think you chose it well, because it does actually touch on you know, the core issue that we're raising here, that there is a, a vital lesson to learn from the past, and that people in the past knew we were already going wrong. They saw the, the track. So, Say something while I get my computer to speak to me, um, and I'll read this passage. I'm running out of, I'm running out of ideas here. Never. John West never runs out of ideas. I don't, I don't run out of babble, but I do sort of run out of <laughs> Okay, so okay. I am going to type in my password. I do remember it, yes. And I am going to open a file. Uh, because I'm 66, I'm going to put on my reading glasses. Oh, all this stuff. And here we go. Asclepius, the lament. Do you know Asclepius? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sartre prompted me to use the microphone. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. yes. Do you know, Asclepius, that Egypt is an image of heaven? Or to speak more exactly, in Egypt, all the operations of the powers which rule and work in heaven are present in the earth below. In fact, it should be said that the whole cosmos dwells in this our land as in a sanctuary. And yet, since it is fitting that wise men should have knowledge of all events before they come to pass, you must not be left in ignorance of what I will now tell you. There will come a time when it will have been in vain that Egyptians have honored the Godhead with heartfelt piety and service, and all our holy worship will be fruitless and ineffectual. The gods will return from earth to heaven. Egypt will be forsaken, and the land which was once the home of religion will be left desolate, bereft of the presence of its deities. O oh, Egypt, Egypt, of thy religion, nothing will remain but an empty tale, which thine own children in time to come will not believe. Nothing will be left but graven words, and only the stones will tell of thy piety. And in that day, men will be weary of life, and they will cease to think the universe worthy of reverent wonder and worship. They will no longer love this world around us, this incomparable work of God, this glorious structure which he has built, this sum of good made up of many diverse forms, this instrument whereby the will of God operates in that which he has made, ungrudgingly favoring man's welfare, this combination and accumulation of all the manifold things that call forth the veneration, praise, and love of the beholder. Darkness will be preferred to light, and death will be thought more profitable than life. No one will raise his eyes to heaven. The pious will be deemed 
insane. The impious, wise. The madman will be thought a brave man, and the wicked will be esteemed as good. As for the soul and the belief that it is immortal by nature or may hope to attain to immortality as I have taught you, all this they will mock and even persuade themselves that it is false. No word of reverence or piety, no utterance worthy of heaven will be heard or believed. And so the gods will depart from mankind, a grievous thing, and only evil angels will remain who will mingle with men and drive the poor wretches into all manner of reckless crime, into wars and robberies and frauds and all things hostile to the nature of the soul. Then the earth will tremble and the sea bear no ships. Heaven will not support the stars in their orbits. All voices of the gods will be forced into silence. The fruits of the earth will rot. The soil will turn barren and the very air will sicken with sullen stagnation. All things will be disordered and awry. All good will disappear. But when all this has befallen Asclepius, then God, the creator of all things, will look on that which has come to pass and will stop the disorder by the counterforce of his will, which is the good. He will call back to the right path those who have gone astray. He will cleanse the world of evil, washing it away with floods, burning it out with the fiercest fire, and expelling it with war and pestilence. And thus, he will bring back his world to its former aspect, so that the cosmos will once more be deemed worthy of worship and wondering reverence. And God, the maker and maintainer of the mighty fabric, will be adored by the men of that day with continuous songs of praise and blessing. Such is the new birth of the cosmos. It is a making again of all things good, a holy and awe-inspiring restoration of all nature. And it is wrought inside the process of time by the eternal will of the Creator. And that's the lament. Yeah, that's... That's worthy of sort of a concentrated study. Somebody should look at that. The, the ecological, environmental side of it is, I mean, unbelievable for 2,000 years ago. The, the quackademics like to think that it's foretelling the downfall of the Roman Empire, but it, it's much more than that. The, the reference to the stars may be an echo from the distant, distant past of that we're talking about, of, of you know, younger Dryas, older Dryas, and so yes. on. It's really, and it's a, it's a breathtaking piece of prose, I must say. Breathtaking piece of prose, um, really astonishing. Whoever, whoever, whoever penned that in the first place, I think it's translated from the Greek. Yeah. And that's the only one translation that's any good. I don't know if you read any of the others, but yeah. all, they all sound like, you know, treatises in economics or something. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's basically it. That's that, that Asclepius. Um, prophecy is is pretty much what we're what we're going through. We're, we're in the middle of, and my only my sense of it is that God's going to need some help. Yeah, He's not yeah. going to do this on His own or her own, whatever the case may be. Yeah, it's up to us at it the is, end of the day. We don't have to, to put up with the bullshit any longer. No? Uh, we can take the choice to change things. It's, it's not easy. It's a difficult road, but it's the road to follow. We can do it. <laughs> yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, okay. I think we've, um, we've come to the end of the formal part of the evening. John and I will be sitting down here and uh, anybody wants books signed or anything else, I do pose for selfies if anybody wants that. Oh, yeah, right. No objection at uh, all. Let's, let's charge for selfies. <laughs> Graham. This, is, this is a source of income that we have not yet tapped. Um, we're I here think. for you. We're, we're here for you. So anything, anything that you want really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.